this interview, we talked to Dr. Emeryn Mayer. And Dr. Mayer is a total phenom in the world of microbiome research. He is currently Distinguished Research Professor in Departments of Medicine, Physiology, and Psychiatry at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, Executive Director of the G. Oppenheimer Center for Neurobiology of Stress and Resilience, and Co-Director of the CURE Digestive Diseases Research Center at UCLA. He has over 353 peer-reviewed research articles that have been published, author of two books, uh, both of which I've read, and they're amazing, The Mind-Gut Connection and The Gut Immune Connection, uh, a very illuminating interview, and has a wonderful YouTube channel under his name, so you can find that out if you want to learn more. Please enjoy the show. So firstly, thank you for taking your time to speak with us. It's an honor to have you on. No, it's it's great. You know, um, I'm, I'm I'm doing a lot of these, and uh, I'm I'm learning from every time I do it. You know, you would think it's always the same, but it's not. So, uh, I wonder if we can start with the definition of the psychobiome. If you could lead us into this, because this is our focus in the upcoming retreat, um, a lot of our work that we do, and uh, you're really at the center of this. So, uh, define that for us if you can. Yeah, so first of all, I have to admit, you know, I, I have not heard or used that term psychobiome, but I love it. Um, you know, what, what has happened in science and to a certain degree, lesser degree in medicine that we we have moved from studying or understanding individual components or cells or receptors to um, the interconnected networks, which are you know, omics in, 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 in science. So we, we went from the microbes to the microbiome. We went from the genes to the genome. Um, went from the individual environmental factors to the exposome. So this is definitely something that, um, you know, when you say psychobiome, so the interaction of, I would say, the mind with these networks, these biological, these biological networks, <clears throat> in in our bodies, um, starting with you know with with the microbiome, another huge network inside of us, but then also extending beyond our own person into into the environment. So, yeah, I love that term. It's essentially, <clears throat> you know, it means for me that um, the the relationship of our mind, which is a productive a product of our <clears throat> of our brain or brain connectome with with the biology um, within us and also around us. Uh, you know, you do. I have both of your books here, and there, people can see those in the background. Um, your first one really does focus on the mind gut connection, and in fact, that's the title of it. Um, a lot of that being. Uh, around mood and emotions, I would say, which is really fascinating to see how, um, you know, things that you are talking about, what were different probiotics, upregulating, downregulating, um, connecting to the vagus nerve, uh, sending different neurotransmitters or, or ha having all these impacts is just fascinating. And it's almost like you can't look at mental health without looking at also the way that the gut and the microbiome there is interfacing with it. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about this mind-gut connection and how the gut talks to the brain and how the brain talks to the gut? So there's different levels that I can explain that on. So from a purely empirical level that that I have um, you know, realized and, and practiced by long before the, the microbiome came on board, when you talk to patients with gastrointestinal problems or patients with anxiety and depression, there almost always is the component of the other side of the brain gut um, axis. So the great majority of the patients that I've seen with so-called functional gastrointestinal disorders like IBS, but also to a similar degree, patients with inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, you, you realize that anxiety, symptom-related fears, um, 
are almost always present to varying degrees, you know, and they can go from small component to a large uh, contribution to the overall picture. Same with 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 depression. Um, so this was for, long, for for quite some time my experience, and you know, studying from the early start of my career, the the brain gut interactions without the microbiome was already you know, fascinating. And um, this this kind of interest goes back to to Russian behavioralists, um, you know, in, in the wake of Pavlov, who have written, these, these were non-peer-reviewed articles, you know, when you look at them today, they're more like prose really describing phenomena. And, um, but it's really been totally neglected by, 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 by Western medicine un, until relatively recently, and it's still not sort of incorporated into the mainstream. But what what is what has happened with, um, and you know, I should say that we thought ten years ago that we could explain all the symptoms that patients and this comorbidity of of mental with with gastrointestinal symptoms. We thought, or well, I thought, ten years ago we could explain this all just by the the brain gut interactions in bi-directional way. So stress, negative emotions, anxiety, um, affecting the gut in a significant way and um, events in the gut, like distensions, contraction, physiological events being amplified um, and be becoming consciously aware, whereas most of us are not aware, um, you know, after eating a meal, these billions of signals that all of a sudden go to the brain. and uh, But what happens in these disorders, including anxiety, these signals are being amplified. So all of a sudden we'll become consciously aware of it. So this is something, this, this visceral hypersensitivity um, and the stress and emotion in, in, induced uh, alterations in gut function was something that you know, was kind of in my mind firmly established 10 years ago. It wasn't really accepted by by mainstream gastroenterology at the time. But then what happened, a very strange thing happened with the microbiome science and a few papers that came out on the role of microbes influencing emotion-like behaviors in mouse models and, and, and rat models. Then all of a sudden... Um, the interest changed to the, the the reception both by the by science but also by the lay public dramatically changed and all of a sudden this became like a household word a word that you know that our microbes have this big influence on when our emotions play a big role in in psychiatric diseases um, a whole field of nutritional psychiatry was created or you know the the food that we eat influences the microbes and then influences the brain. So this has really changed. Um, but we have to realize today, you know, and as a scientist, I'm always very careful. I can't do what a lot of people in the social media space can do to talk about as it is now an established fact that, you know, you can treat depression or, um, channel anxiety is ordered with, with, with probiotics or psychobiotics. Um, being a scientist and being always very careful, I'm still waiting for the, um, for, for the, the high quality uh, studies that show a, a causative relationship in humans between the gut microbes, the diet, and what goes on, you know, in, in, in terms of our um, symptoms. I mean, there are, the, the certain symptoms or certain phenomena like satiety, for example, or the pleasure after eating a meal, that we could explain even before the microbes with you know satiety hormones being released in the gut and activating the vagus nerve and then going to the to the brainstem <clears throat> and and higher centers, causing dopamine release. Um, and now we know that the microbes talk to these cells in the gut that produce these satiety hormones. But so satiety <clears throat> and the pleasure associated with eating <clears throat> is, is, is one of these um, 
phenomena that's quite well established, you know, but the other ones, um, if if you change your, 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 the gut microbial composition, is this going to make you happier or is this going to make you more depressed? I think you still need a lot of human studies, which are difficult to do, expensive to do. And I've always struggled with this concept, lost in translation. So how how do you confirm what you see clear cut in, in animal models and reductionistic models where you can isolate all the contributing factors and create a totally artificial environment? And then you see these effects. But in humans who are genetically different, who are from the microbiome make up different, have different diets, um, have different, you know, things going on in their mind, it's it's much, much more difficult to get uh, get an answer on that. And I, I think it will ultimately happen. I, I think it will be one component of these mental disorders. The big question is in humans, again, with our big prefrontal cortex processing so many different influences, um, what percentage of the variance does this microbial input cause? Is it mm. is it 5% or is it 80% like in these animal models? You know, if, um, I would say for anxiety and depression, I would say it's more like the, the 5%. Um, for other brain disorders like... Um, Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, I think it's higher. It's maybe like 50%. Um, so, yeah, so it's it's a very exciting field that has revolutionized and will be revolutionizing psychiatry even more in the future. But um, I, I think today we have to treat it with caution. This... Well, I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit um, here between your books. Uh, because of a comment that you made, you know, your second book, uh, The Gut Immune Connection, which people can see in your background there, um, you talk uh, in there about the correlation between um, immune dysfunction uh, happening at the gut lining level and something like depression and anxiety. And so, you know, you, you know, when you were mentioning earlier that we, you know, we don't have these definitive models about, uh, you know, specific microbes and whatnot, and the effect that they have on on mental health. But there is a correlation between dysfunctional uh, gut lining, you know, dysfunction at the gut lining level, and the effects that, that has on on mental health. Is that is that safe to say? Uh, that's safe to say, and I and I would say this is where this field has moved the furthest, and you know, are the most exciting um, uh, results coming out. So we have to realize that, the, you know, the, this 40 trillion microbes that live inside of our gut, primarily the end of the small intestine and the colon, that they're only separated by microns, you know, a very tiny space from 70% of the body's immune system. That So they're, they're so closely adjacent that um, as an engineer, you would never design such an interface because it would be much too dangerous that a break happens and you get a full-blown activation of your immune system. And um, these full-blown breaks are generally not happening, but what we know now, the microbes play and the products that they produce, um, they play a big role in assuring this, that the integrity of that barrier, that intestinal barrier, um, leading to a situation that's been in the lay press referred to as the leaky gut. Um, so that's a situation where then these microbes come in contact with immune cells. Some of these immune cells, you know, have these sensors that stick into the gut lumen. And if the mucus layer shrinks and the integrity of that barrier is cell barrier um, is compromised, then the microbes in the gut, even though they're not pathogens, you know, they're healthy symbiotic microbes, they come in contact with these sensors, these dendritic cells, and then that triggers the alarm bell in the gut-based immune system. And there's probably different stages. There's not just a leaky gut. I mean, there's different stages of very mild forms um, to ultimately full-blown activation of the gut-based immune system 
and then uh, break down all the barriers between the cells lining the gut. Then the, the, the actual microbes get into the circulation or fragments of their membrane. And that triggers then a full-blown immune response. It doesn't stay in the gut, but that spreads throughout the body. Some of these dendritic cells, these early sensors, can migrate into the liver. Then, you know, the liver becomes an inflammatory organ that, again, amplifies. And so in these neurodegenerative diseases that I mentioned earlier, and, and also in some, in some subsets of patients with depression, you have that inflammatory component. And so when these gut-produced inflammation molecules, signaling molecules, get to the brain that can cross the blood barrier, they engage immune cells, the glial cells in the brain. Then, then, then these cells in the brain produce cytokines, the, you know, important inflammatory molecules, and that triggers a whole cascade of changing neurotransmission and neurotoxicity and neurodegeneration. All these scenarios, um, the, the, you know, they're not sort of the simple. Um, yes or no situation or health and disease it's i think it's a continuum and depending on somebody's genetic um, vulnerability they, they will lead to you know major um, diseases such as depression such as alzheimer's such as uh, parkinson's so not not everybody who has these changes in the gut at the gut level triggered by microbial immune interactions develops these diseases and I should say another thing, so this connection between the gut microbes and the immune cells in the gut also requires the input that comes primarily from the diet. So the diet you know, determines what the composition and the activity, the function of the microbes is. The microbes have millions of genes that they can produce all kinds of substances depending on what you feed them. Also depending on what the brain, what signals the brain sends, you know, like during stress, uh, particularly chronic stress. And so you have this, these interlocking networks from the diet, the microbiome composition and function, um, the gut barrier, the gut-based immune system, and then it spreads to the body. So that concept is firmly established, I would say. And I think the the insights that we gain from <clears throat> this concept that chronic um, maladaptive engagement of the immune system is at the is at the core of most of our chronic diseases. I think that's also becoming fairly well established. So we have a whole new dis group of disorders, you know, that range from <clears throat> that range from um yeah alzheimer's disease to cardiovascular disease to cancer um and it's it's intriguing that all of these have that inflammatory component and therefore they're all somehow related to the gut and these mechanisms that i explained to you that's the real revolution i think you, you know one thing that you just really imprinted on my mind in the book was the uh, on the importance of the mucin layer and you mentioned it in your description just now but uh, it kind of coming for me coming at it more of a functional from a functional medicine standpoint that's not really discussed it's all about basically food particles getting into the the bloodstream and the food antigens and the, act, the immune activation there um, and so i'm just that that was really profound and and how one would go about maintaining a healthy mucin layer. And so talk about this, please. This is so fascinating. Yeah, so the 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 mucin, the, the mucin in the gut is produced by specialized cells in in you know mainly in, in the colon, the small intestine as well. The so-called goblet cells that are filled with mucin and there's, there's a whole physiology around how they're stimulated, but the production is one thing, the degradation is another thing. And so the, the stimuli, they come from certain microbes to stimulate production. And on the other hand, the 
ability of certain microbes to live off the mucin because it's a it's a carbohydrate uh, entity. So some some people can really some um, some microbes when we fast or when we starve when they don't get the carbohydrates, which is their, their main food supply from the diet, they can feed on, on the mucin um, that's produced by, by our intestine. And it's it's the turnover rate. It's, so it's not like, you know, if, if, if certain bacteria, um, like, you know, the, the acamansia, for example, is, 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 is one of those um, um, genera that... So they can both feed on um, on 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 the mucin, but also in some ways stimulate the increased production. So you have an increased turnover. So fasting is not something that gives you a leaky gut, um, because you, what you essentially do, you change the turnover rate. Um, and I'm not sure if you know exactly why this is beneficial, but. Um, so, yeah, so the fact that certain healthy things actually lead to a consumption or almost cannibalism of our own, you know, main protective layer is, um, seems paradoxical, but it's, but, but it's, but it's not, it's, if you understand that, you know, if, if you remove some of this mucus that our um, goblet cells make up for that with increased production, and that some microbes are involved both in the consumption of the mucin, but also in the stimulation of, of, of the production. And what, what kind of time frame are we talking about with fasting that would trigger this response? Um, well, I mean, I'm not sure if this has been studied exactly. I would say given on what well, we know that within 24 hours of a dietary change, not, not necessarily fasting, but a dietary change, you already change your microbial makeup, your composition and the function, that this is a fairly rapid thing. Um, yeah, my, my guess is it would be within 24 hours that you see these effects already. Um, but I do want to emphasize that does not lead to a compromised gut barrier, you know, that phenomenon. Um, a... Um, uh, the effect of an unhealthy, of a chronically unhealthy diet that does not contain uh, in, in, uh, enough of um, food for the microbes to increase the ecosystem and the increase the abundance of certain beneficial microbes like the acamansia. Um, that's a different story that that will lead gradually to a decrease in in. And it's it's not just quantitative decrease; it's very also a, a qualitative change in 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 the mucus layer um, that leads to you know this. And say a little bit more about this. So the you know the mucus layer has two sub layers: one that faces the bacteria in the inside, and one the outside. The one that faces the bacteria is actually permeable um, to microbes, and that's where they would live when they feed on the mucin. So um, ultimately, if this internal layer shrinks, then um, the microbes come too close into the external layer, just made up, you know, by, by different molecules, and then um, that carries the risk then of a contact between microbial membranes and these sensors. Um, um, you know, from 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 the dendritic cells, from the immune cells. So there's a there's a variation in that's within the norm, sort of a a shrinkage of the inner layer to a certain degree will not cause any problems, but once that continues, you know, and and, and you get this this inappropriate contact with, um, with with the immune system, then it becomes an issue. Um, and, and I always emphasize, I mean the. You know the, the the engineering. I mean, this has obviously happened over you know millions of years of evolution. is is pretty amazing that you come up with a system like that. That that on the one side has the threat of of death, really of uh, toxemia. You know that 
full-blown engagement of the immune system. And on the other hand, is is one of the most health-promoting systems that we have. Um, so it's it's really remarkable. I, I have been dying to ask you this question um, around immune activation. In, in your view, what do you think is creating a greater immune activation? These microbes coming in contact with these sensors or food passing through these tight junctions and uh, and and it, which one do you think is playing a greater role? So it wouldn't be the food passing through these compromised uh, tight junctions. It, it would be either fragments of uh, the membrane of gram-negative bacteria, so this lipopolysaccharide and a group of molecules called with the acronym MAMPS, um, they interact with specific with toll like receptors, um, you know, which which are receptors in the gut and interestingly throughout the body. We didn't really know why they're even in the uh, even in the brain. You have these same receptors that respond to fragments, to membrane fragments of of microbes. So why would you have these receptors at the brain level? Well, you have them because these fragments can go through these compromised tight junctions into the systemic circulation and then you know go to multiple areas in the body including the brain and um so it's it's that phenomenon that is really the problem with this immune activation it's it's not it's not the food components um because you know many well, most food components are either absorbed in the small intestine so they they are meant to get into the circulation or they are broken down by by microbes into into smaller entities that can be absorbed so there's this whole group of large molecular entities that cannot be absorbed in the small intestine but then the microbes break them down so food and its components is supposed to go into the systemic circulation that's its main goal um, but these Membrane components or intact microbes are not supposed to be there, obviously, you know, so that's, and that would rings the alarm bell with these toll-like receptors. That's, that's really interesting because I, I can tell you I've heard from, gosh, many functional medicine uh, practitioners that are, uh, you know, disseminating this idea that, uh, you know, whole proteins from food are passing through these, these, um, uh, these tight junctions that have separated and that that is creating an immune response. Um, so it's good to have that cleared up. Um, and, and so that, that's, that's actually really, really interesting and, and makes this uh, focus on the mucin layer a little bit, an understanding more nuanced, I should, I should say, because um, if the, it, if it's really about, so you mentioned fasting as one way that you can increase turnover, which would increase growth and in, in the health of this mucin layer. Um, you talked about acromancia, and we have uh, we've spoken to Colleen Cutliffe about acromancia a little bit. And I know you're on the, the that scientific mm -hmm. advisory board. Um, is acromancia the key one, or are there others that are involved in this mucus regulatory process? It's been studied pretty. Yeah, probably the the you know the majority of studies have been done on that organism, and also, does it require the the live organism? Does it require some of the metabolites it generates, or is it enough? Um, can you use dead you know bacteria to produce the same effect? So there's there's a lot of effort in startup companies, you know, particularly in Belgium, where this has been studied extensively. Um, to come up with with therapeutics, um, it's I think like in with most other uh, microbial functions, I I do not believe it's the only one. It's 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 an important one. It's a powerful one, um, you know. And and there are like um, you know, um, uh, Colleen's company. They have done a study that you know that has shown benefits from. Um, from taking their preparation, uh, which are life, acromancia, uh, on on metabolic health, so 
My answer to your question would be, I don't believe it's the only one. I think the microbial or microbiome science always involves multiple organisms working as a consortium. And, um, um, but, but it's an important one and, and it's a well-studied one, you know, where we, we know more about the mechanisms than about some of the, from some of the others. Um, you know, one, one more question on this thread uh, before we shift gears. I'd like to hear a little bit about butyrate and the importance of butyrate in the gut, and 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 does that have an impact on gut lining? So butyrate, you know, one of the short, one of the best studied short chain fatty acids, um, is um, yeah. I mean, always refer to it as sort of the the body's aspirin because it has. So this has multiple effects, multiple beneficial effects on multiple cell types and systems in the body, from the gut to the immune cells to nerve cells, all the way to the to uh, to the brain. Um, and you could almost say, you know, what we understand the best to date um, about the benefits of the microbiome and also, you know, as a potential cause for many of these disorders that we talked about is the, is the production, sufficient production of these, of the short chain fatty acids, particularly butyrate. It's, that is a regional thing. So just swallowing a capsule with butyrate and it goes all over the gut may not be the most efficient way of, you know, taking advantage of this system because there's regional differences of bacteria that produce it in different quantities. But overall, you could say it's it's always the agent that counteracts inflammatory influences. Um, and <clears throat> I don't know off the top of my head if it plays a direct role in mucin production uh, or, or, or degradation, but it certainly comes in immediately to, to, to uh, decrease or downregulate any immune activation that that, that occurs when this uh, this barrier is 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 compromised, and it's almost like the yin and yang. When 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 you look at you know the mechanisms in the brain that have been characterized, <clears throat> there's always some inflammatory mediators, um, and there is always the short chain fatty acids, the butyrate uh, that counteract it. And so, in my opinion, the, the way you know these systems are organized. I think it's um, it's with both agonists and antagonists, and it's the balance between these two that really determines the you know the healthy state. Uh, and it's shifted in one direction. Um, you know it's 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 associated with with brain health, and it's shifted the other direction. It's associated with low grade brain inflammation and you know neuroinflammation. With regard to the the gut based immune system, where what um, where does uh, secretory IgA kind of fall into the spectrum here? Um, it's it's one, you know, it's it's one of several mechanisms, defense mechanisms that the gut has, um, you know, in in response to. Um, to antigens that are maybe contained in the uh, in in the food or in in, in organisms, um, I'm not an expert in that particular um, area, but it's certainly you know there's there, there's a number of these molecules like defensins are another group of molecules that are produced in specialized gut cells that are secreted into the lumen of the gut and have these. These, uh, as the name says, uh, defensins. You know these these actions defending against any um, you know pathological signals that would come from the gut, in many infectious organisms. Um, but specifically now, you know, what what role IgA? I mean, I know it's it's a uh, it's a focus in functional medicine. Um, you know, and 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 these 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 antibodies produce. By, by the body and uh, in, in different um, allergic situations, I'm, I'm I have to admit I'm I'm not an expert in this in this area. Uh, okay, um, you you uh, put a portion of your book towards 
the development, you know, childhood development of the microbiota. And, um, and one of the things I thought was just fascinating was the relationship of that to stress and the stress level of the mother in particular. Um, can you discuss this a little bit, please? Yeah, this is a fascinating area and it's still evolving. So, you know, a lot of research has focused on the, um, on the postnatal events and the early life events, like the first three years when the microbiome, when the ecosystem is established and programmed. Um, but um, there's also been a growing interest in, <clears throat> in the intrauterine phase <clears throat> and even in the preconception phase, which is really amazing. So there's, there's evidence now certainly um, that the health of the mother, both in terms of their the, the psychological, you know, health, but also in terms of the mother's gut health, that that has a major influence on on the developing fetus. And the when you think about this, so the same phenomena that occur in 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 the newborn are present already fully evolved in the mother. So if the mother is an on an unhealthy inflammatory diet. Um, these inflammatory molecules don't just stay with the mother. They go through the placenta to the fetus and are influencing brain development in, 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 in the fetus. So, um, and there's evidence, for example, that um, <clears throat> metabolic syndrome in the mother is a risk factor, for example, for autism spectrum in the offspring. And, you know, which is uh, uh, also <clears throat> viral infections in the mother is a risk factor for a significant risk factor for um, autism uh, development in, in, in the offspring. So inflammatory events in the mother, either dietary tr triggered or, um, uh, you know, diet triggered are are definitely risk factors in this. So this is where it starts, where the microbiome plays a role already in influencing the offspring's trajectory in life. And there's now another, uh, you know, growing evidence that that preconception stress, this has been mainly studied in, in males. It's easier to study in males. Um, the preconception stress has an epigenetic effect on 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 the on 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 the sperm, um, and then that is transmitted, <clears throat> uh, you know, all the way to um, fertilization and the 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 development of the fetus, which which is kind of amazing that it would start, you know, way before. I mean, obviously the the um, stress effect on males doesn't require the the, the microbiota. Um, but certainly the, the stress effects in the diet in the mother, in the pregnant mother, has a major effect. And I I, I don't think we really, <clears throat> I don't think that mothers are aware of that. Many um, pregnant women are aware of this, you know, that if they are obese, if they have metabolic syndrome, if they have uh, any of these metabolic um, dysregulations, are on an unhealthy diet that this really puts their offspring at an increased risk. We, we we know it for autism, but it's probably the case also for for other psychiatric and neurological diseases. It's 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 really incredible. Um, I, I think the last thing I'd like to cover with you, um, you still have a few minutes. Uh, yes, sure. Is about sleep, and you detail this interesting, um, you don't call it a peristolic wave, you, you have a different name for it. Um, but if you could talk to us about how sleep and, and the gut are connected. Yeah, so since the brain and the gut are so closely connected, obviously sleep, <clears throat> the change in the function of the brain during sleep has to have a, a counterpart in, in, in the gut. And and there's sort of multiple levels. So one is, um, and I don't know if 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 you want to, uh, I want to address it. If you, so today um, in our world where we are inundated with power bars and snacks, and so our in, in, intestinal tract is pretty uh, rarely 
really empty throughout the, the waking hours. So the only time that it, it is empty is during sleep. And what happens during sleep is that our digestive pattern, the contractions and the secretions in the gut switch from sort of a peristaltic, semi-random contractile secretory pattern, moving things back and forth and storing it in, in the large intestine to one that's characterized by a tr uh, impressive rhythmicity of 90 minutes that like a clock, like a clockwork, a wave of contractions and secretions goes from the esophagus all the way to the end of your intestine. And <clears throat> this was discovered some 25 years ago when I, you know, in my early part of my career, this was a big discovery. We didn't really know exactly what's called the housekeeper of the gut, this wave, this migrating motor complex. Um, and it was thought that it, it clears out the debris and uh, undigestible components from your intestine and moves it downstream. What is more, much more likely, based on our knowledge today, it's a main regulatory mechanism for the spatial distribution or the, like the geography of our microbiome, that it moves things that have moved up during the daytime, during eating, into the small intestine. Everything is being moved down again and cleared out um, sort of a, a street sweeper, you know, that, um, and if if that if that mechanism is not present, then this was also something that, you know, we learned 20, 30 years ago that um, this small bowel bacterial overgrowth at the time, you know, was a condition that was relatively rarely diagnosed in conditions where this migrating motor complex was absent. So in patients with scleroderma or um, some other motility disorders, um, that it was not present. And then the bacteria could migrate up into the intestine and cause all kinds of pretty severe symptoms, range from diarrhea to malabsorption. And um, so, I mean, the way I look at this is, this is an, a built-in automatic cleansing mechanism that if we utilize it correctly and extend the time that we let this operate, you know, we don't have to worry about cleansing, um, you know, cleansing retreats or cleansing diets or cleansing interventions because our body does that itself in a pretty effective and efficient way. Um, this is probably also, so not only we would like to expand this from, so some people today pride themselves, they only sleep four hours, primarily uh, startup executives, you know, that rack, they only need four hours of sleep. That's why it's so productive. It's it's probably not a good thing for your body and, and for definitely not for your brain gut interaction and your microbiome and this inflammatory situation, because then you reduce that time even more, you know, you right. would, um, so there's, there's other things. Um, so intermittent fasting for time restricted eating, which I prefer, um, does that to a certain degree that, you know, not just during sleep, but we expand that time to 16 hours, um, where the gut is empty, that maybe it's most beneficial effect really, um, um, even though there's other potential benefits of not, you know, eating snacks and things all the time. And, <clears throat> but the sleep has other um, anti-inflammatory um, effects. So a sleep deficiency will lead to an engagement of the immune system. And if you combine this with an unhealthy diet, we don't have enough production of these anti-inflammatory molecules, you know, you have a perfect storm. And so... Nobody, nobody yeah. has that these days. This is, the, <laughs> this, is, this is the main problem today, that multiple factors all go in the same wrong direction. You know, it's, yeah. it's not just the diet. It's, it's not only the sleep. It's not only the lack of exercise, all of these together. And they converge... This is an intriguing thing. They converge on the immune system in some way or another, you know, and that's why we have this epidemic of these non-contagious diseases, because in our society, the last 75 years, 
all these bad lifestyle habits have increased and uh, uh, you know it, explanations have come up like you know why exercise brings more oxygen to your brain that's probably the least important um, mechanism it's really how regular moderate exercise influences this gut immune gut microbial immune interface as 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 well as well as the diet as well as the healthy sleep so yeah i always laugh about um you know also the concept of brain hacking that we can sort of do better than evolution has come up with in terms of these uh, regulatory mechanisms something that you may have heard from many of your functional medicine um you know interviewees on this on this show it's it's the lifestyle you know it's and it's it does require the awareness first and then the the discipline and the motivation to actually pursue different strategies not pop uh, supplements not uh, do all sorts of strange and expensive you know interventions it's it's really sticking to that um you know, to, to to this healthy lifestyle paradigm. Um, you know, one thing I didn't mention, so sleep, but also related to that in some ways is 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 meditation. So contemplative practices, um, less well studied in terms of the effects on the microbiome. Even though there's some studies now that that have addressed this, we've done an unpublished study where we could show this as well. That mindfulness, of course, of mindfulness-based stress reduction would have an effect on the microbes. But I would bet my money on it. If you are a regular meditator, um, you will have a different gut microbiome um, and less to that immune activation than than somebody who who does not do that. That 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 would be really interesting to study. Um, I I don't know how you would figure out how to control for food in that, but uh, you know, it, <laughs> but uh, you know, similar things have been done with re in contemplative neuroscience. So, um, you, you know, looking at uh, long-term meditators' brains that are practicing different styles of meditation, different regions and circuits that are activating or deactivating as a result of that, it'd be interesting to see how the gut microbiota is interfacing with all of that really fascinating stuff yeah this whole thing about the engagement of the default mode network what influence does this have on on, on the gut and the gut microbes yeah i think that that's a really intriguing question is this an active area study um i'm, I'm aware of one group who is doing who has an ongoing study on this where we are doing the microbiome analysis um I wouldn't be surprised because, you know, nowadays everybody collects stool samples during their studies. So I wouldn't be surprised if that uh, happen, is happening in this area as well. The, w one of the issues is microbiome science has moved so rapidly and continues to move so rapidly, both in, in terms of the concepts, but also in, in terms of the way the, um, the analyses are done. And we're no longer really focusing on individual microbial strains and, uh, you know, genera. Um, we're really focusing on the, the, the metabolome that they create, these ecosystems. And so this is really the kind of study that we need, you know, does the default, does the default mode network coordinate with what um, meta, um, um, metabolite signature does that correlate and does it change it? Um, I'm not aware that anybody is doing these studies at the moment. Well, wonderful. I, I would love to learn about whoever you do know that's doing something similar. You you mentioned one group. Yeah, and um, I can I can send you, you know, the email. I I, I can introduce my email to that person. Wonderful. Well, uh, Doctor Emerin, thank you. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, I, everyone should know that he has two books out, The Mind-Gut Connection and The Gut Immune Connection. Uh, you also have a wonderful YouTube channel where you interview a lot of experts in your field and uh, colleagues, it looks like, um, uh, academics, professors, scientists, this sort. And, um, and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you.
If I could also mention a, a couple more things I'm very excited about at the moment. So the Got Immune Connection will come out under a new title as a paperback in June. Um, the Mind Got Immune Connection, because I think we forgot that in the beginning when we published the heart, um, the you know the heart cover. Um, and we're also working right now um, very intensely on a documentary for PBS uh, with the working title, The Mind Got Immune Connection, which will come out in December. Wonderful. That is exciting. Wow. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to that for sure. Um, and uh, if people want to follow you, where's the best way to go for that? Probably the easiest way is to go to my website because there you can sign up for, you know, our newsletter um, and the, the, you know, social media channels. Um, so it's emeronmayer.com, one word. And um, yeah, I would highly recommend for people to subscribe to the newsletter as, as well because we try to feature topics of, of, of interest in this you know, what we talked about in the beginning, this large space from individual health, gut health, brain health, but also all the way to environmental health and soil health. So wonderful. Well, good. Thank you again. And uh, take care, everybody. Okay. Thanks.